Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kate Miller, and I am a reference specialist in the music division of the Library of Congress. And I'm happy to welcome you, and I want to thank you for coming to our fall 2018 American Musicological Society Library of Congress lecture. Um, we've been running this lecture series for about 10 years now. And uh, twice a year now, we have heard from various members of the American Musicological Society uh, about their, their research that they have done in the music division's collections, looking at print and manuscript scores and correspondence and the personal papers of composers and artists um, that we have in the music division's collections. Tonight is a little bit different. We pivot a little bit and we look at the collections of our Recorded Sound Research Center at the library. Um, and I want to point out that we are recording this for webcasts like we always do. So tonight's lecture is going to become a part of our, our digital collections as well. And I would like to now introduce Dr. Will Robin from the University of Maryland School of Music. And he's going to um, offer some greetings from the American Musicological Society and introduce tonight's speaker. Um, so greetings from the American Musicological Society. Um, I'm Will Robin, I'm a musicologist at the University of Maryland um, and a member of the American Musicological Society. Um, and I'm delighted to be introducing this evening on behalf of the AMS, um, Hu Jung Park, um, sorry, Hei Jung Park. Hei Jung um, is a PhD candidate in musicology at Ohio State University and recent recipient of the Alvin H. Johnson AMS 50 uh, Dissertation Fellowship, which is one of our most prestigious prizes. Each year, our society awards only three AMS 50s, which provide for a full year of funding so that award winners can complete their doctoral dissertations. Given solely on the basis of academic merit, the AMS 50 is a rigorously competitive fellowship, and it's wonderful that the scholar's vital research not only won the award, but also draws on materials held in the Library of Congress's collections, which is why she is here with us today. Park's research addresses music's role in the relationship between Korea and the United States between 1941 and 1960. She has presented at annual meetings of the AMS, the Society for Ethnomusicology, the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, and the Association for Asian Studies. Her research has also been supported by the Marjorie Lowen's Dissertation Research Fellowship from the Society for American Music. In her lecture this evening, titled From World War to Cold War, Music in America's Radio Propaganda in Korea, Park will discuss shortwave radio programs of news and music that were broadcast by the U.S. Office of War Information in Korea during World War II, which was the only opportunity for Koreans to hear American music in this period, and heroically portrayed the United States as liberators of the Korean people. This role for music in the radio continued during the U.S. occupation of Korea, of, sorry, of Southern Korea during the war um, and after the war, along with the restoration of quote-unquote authentic Korean traditional music that was lost um, under Japanese rule. In examining these wartime music policies and their after effects, she reveals an undiscovered continuity between World War II and Cold War musical propaganda efforts. Um, so let's welcome her, and I'm looking forward to this talk. Thank you so much uh, for the warm welcome and generous introduction. Uh, it is an honor to be one of the speakers uh, for this joint lecture of the American Musicological Society and the Library of Congress. It is a particular joy to come back to the Library of Congress to talk about my research uh, because some of my most exciting discoveries were made here. As I was looking for uh, sources about music in U.S. radio propaganda toward Korea, I came to the Library of Congress uh, to examine the materials in the Voice of America collection. As is well known, the Voice of America um, was one of the most significant radio propaganda channels for the U.S. government uh, during uh, Cold War. 
My original plan was to listen to music uh, in the Voice of America transmitted toward South Korea during the 1950s and 1960s. But um, at the Recorded Sound Research Center, I encountered wonderful sound recordings, not only of those broadcasts, uh, but also of the Korean language radio news transmitted by the U.S. Office of War Information, or OWI, during World War II. Surprisingly, the OWI's Korean language radio news transmitted um, by the OWI, um, surprisingly, uh, these materials have not only verbal messages, but also music. Uh, like other foreign language radio news transmitted by the OWI, Almost all the Korean language radio news had the same basic format. Around 10 to 15 minutes of Korean language news, radio news, and followed by about two minutes of music. It was such a wonderful discovery in my life as a musicologist. Um, this Korean language radio news transmitted by the OWI had hardly been studied at all. And I did not suspect that they contained music. The music in the OWI's Korean language radio programs uh, demonstrates that the musical diplomacy programs carried out by the United States during the Cold War had uh, roots in wartime propaganda. I owe deep thanks to David Sager and Brian Cornell at the Recorded Sound Research Center who recommended that I examine the OWI collection. I'm also grateful to Todd Harvey at the American Folklife Center, who generously shared his knowledge of research sources at the Library of Congress. In 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the US government not only entered a war in the Pacific theater, uh, but also initiated intensive um, psychological warfare against Japan. This circumstance uh, made the U.S. government begin to pay attention to Korea because Korea had been under Japanese occupation since 1910. Many Korean people held strong anti-Japanese sentiments and carried out an independence movement against Japan. Thus, U.S. government officials saw an opportunity to weaken Japanese power by encouraging Koreans to rise up against the Japanese. Shortwave radio broadcasting was a powerful weapon for US wartime propaganda. Thanks to shortwave radio technology, uh, the United States was able to transmit its radio programs directly from the United States to Asia. The shortwave radio technology mattered especially um, in propaganda toward Korea because the Japanese colonial government strictly banned American culture um, in colonial Korea after uh, the outbreak of the Pacific War. Uh, that is to say, under Japan, Japan's strict ban on American culture, the US radio broadcasts were the only channel by which Korean people could access American music and messages from the United States. From the U.S. perspective, uh, it was the Pacific War that sharpened the U.S. government's interest in Korea. But from the Korean perspective, uh, the United States had been shaping Korean culture for decades. In 1882, Korea and the United States signed a Treaty of Peace, Commerce, and Navigation. This treaty allowed American missionaries to visit Korea and thereby introduced Western music into the everyday experience of Korean people. Through the missionaries, uh, Korean people learned Protestant hymn. The first Korean Christian hymn book was published by an American missionary, Horace Grant Underwood, in 1894. This hymn book included 117 American hymns and gospel songs translated into Korean. 
The missionaries also taught uh, Korean people to play Western instruments, such as organs and violins. Through this effort, Western music spread rapidly in Korea. And during the Japanese occupation in the 1920s and 1930s, American jazz was imported into Korea. In the 1930s, many Korean singers adapted American jazz and released albums. For example, in 1936, Louis Armstrong's St. Louis Blues was remade by Korean singer Kim Yong-hwan entitled Mujeonghan Saram, A Cold-Hearted Man. In 1939, Benny Goodman and his orchestra's Sing 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 was remade by famous Korean musician Son Mogin, entitled Sing Sing Sing. And let me play a part of Son Mogin's Sing Sing Sing. Sing, 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 what cut in no de hell? What in you, what in you, Nama cut in no de hell? Sing, 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 on the gun day no de hell? What in you, what in you, Moda cut in no de hell? Tankoman in no de hell, God in Mata Mitin, Moda no de hell. By the end of the 1930s, then the, the sound of American jazz was familiar to many Korean people. Western classical music was also uh, Western classical music also spread in Korea during this period. In 1923, European violinist Joshua Heifetz and Fritz Chrysler visited Korea and gave recitals. The Korean branch of Nippon Columbia, affiliated with America's Columbia Record released Western classical music, including Chrysler's Liebesfreud, Love's Joy, Franz Schubert's Serenade, and Robert Schumann's Troy Marai in the 1930s. All in all, Korean people became familiar with diverse Western musical styles in the first few decades of the 20th century. However, the outbreak of World War II uh, changed the circumstances in Korea. As the United States supported Great Britain against Germany, the Empire of Japan explicitly expressed its disdain for the United States. In the second week of October 1940, the State Department evacuated U.S. nationals from East Asia. At the time, American missionaries who had contributed uh, to the dissemination of Western and American music in Korea also returned to the United States. As enemy music, American music was banned in Korea by the Japanese. In this context, the U.S. government transmitted its Korean language radio news broadcast to the Korean Peninsula together with music. The earliest report of U.S. government's radio broadcasts in the Korean language is an article um, that appeared in a Korean newspaper, Shin Han Minwo, on December 25th, uh, 1941. Uh, that's a few weeks after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. This article reported that the U.S. Office of the Coordinator of Information had broadcast a Korean language radio program. The Office of the Coordinator of Information, um, abbreviated to COI, was an intelligence and propaganda agency established by the Roosevelt administration in 1941. The COI was not the first U.S. government agency for U.S. propaganda abroad. Already in 1940, by establishing the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, or CIA, the U.S. government instituted radio propaganda toward Latin America. As the war escalated, the Roosevelt administration established the COI in order to expand its propaganda to other countries outside Latin America, including Europe and Asia. The Foreign Information Service, or FIS, 
was in charge of foreign radio propaganda in the CEOI. And in 1942, Roosevelt created a new information agency, the Office of War Information. And FIS became OWI's overseas branch. The OWI continued until the end of World War II. The radio programs run by the COI and OWI are the origin of the Voice of America radio programs, one of the most significant US propaganda channels during the Cold War. The name Voice of America already began to be used uh, by announcers of the OWI radio programs toward Europe beginning in 1942. They introduced the OWI radio programs as the voice of America uh, in their broadcasts. Instead of the term VOA, however, the OWI frequently used the title Liberty Bell for Korean language radio programs. The goal of US radio propaganda toward Korea was clear. A memorandum written on February 15, 1943 in the OWI describes the effort to convince Koreans of four points. First, the Japan will be defeated. Second, the Japan's coming defeated, Japan's coming defeat is Korea's opportunity. Third, that there will never be peace under Japan's present government. Fourth, that the United States is committed to a policy of making Korea, like other oppressed nations, free again. This is why the OWI entitled its Korean language program, Liberty Bell. By encouraging Korean people's desire for independence from Japan, the OWI emphasized that Korea's liberation would be achieved through the help of the United States. The content of the Korean news in Liberty Bell matched these goals. In, in the Liberty Bell broadcast on April 17, 1945, about the speech of the US President Franklin Roosevelt, the announcer highlighted the justice of the United States fighting against the Nazis and the Japanese. All the news in the Liberty Bell was delivered in the Korean language. And I listened and translated into English, quote. As US citizens, we will never avoid our responsibilities. We require peace that is permanent. If we end the war, that will be the end of all wars. We will root out the battlegrounds caused by vicious and inhumane minds. The Nazis were powerful in the past. However, they have done so many horrible and brutal things. As a result, they are now on the road to collapse. The Japanese who attacked Pearl Harbor are paying for that in their own land. Nevertheless, it will never be enough for us, the United States, to just conquer our enemies. We will keep fighting against all kinds of suspicions Fears, disdains, and greed which caused such a terrible war until we conquer all of them completely." End quote. Liberty Bell also magnified US military power. In the Liberty Bell, broadcast on July 21st, 1945, the announcer enumerated the Japanese vessels and fighters destroyed by the US military forces in Okinawa and described a famous and formidable US strategic bomber called the, the Super Fortress. Clearly, the purpose of the US radio propaganda was to encourage Korean people to rise up against Japan and subvert Japanese colonial rule in Korea. In Liberty Bell, the United States was described as the bringer of Korea's freedom. The script for the OWI's foreign language news were created at the OWI's news bureau. On top of that, American missionaries who visited Korea and returned to the United States 
contributed to the creation of Korean language radio programs in the OWI. Former American missionary E.W. Kunz was one of those who provided information about Korea and gave guidelines for script writers for the Liberty Bell. Horace Horton Underwood, another American missionary, also worked for the OWI. As the son of Horace Grant Underwood, who published the first hymn book in Korea, he had long continued his father's missionary work in Korea. And in 1942, the Japanese government general of Korea sent him back to the United States. And in 1944, Underwood sent a message to the Korean people through the OWI's special program entitled Voice of Freedom. Quote, since the war began, not only Americans, but also the US government understood and sympathized with the pol political conditions of Korea and the oppression which Koreans have suffered from Japan, end quote. And he added, quote, at Cairo, it was said, the three powers, China, Great Britain, and the United States, mindful of the enslavement of people of Korea, are determined that in due course, Korea shall become free and independent. The three countries deciding in this way, not only Koreans in America, but many uh, people in the three great powers have greatly rejoiced. A meeting was held in the town hall in New York City, where many hundreds of people gathered to hear about Korea and to rejoice with Korea. That even I had an opportunity to say a few words that night, I considered as a great honor. A society to help the independence movement of Korea is now being organized, end quote. In this message, Underwood said that American and Korean people in the United States greatly rejoiced over the communique of Cairo conference. Yet, Underwood's statement was not true. In fact, at the time, many Korean people in the United States and China were furious about the communique of the conference. Now, this is because by adding the word in due course, uh, this communique strongly insinuated that the rule of the Korean Peninsula would be taken over by another power, even after the downfall of Japan, which really happened. But needless to say, what Korean people wanted was not to become a protectorate again, but immediate independence from Japan after Japan's defeat. Thus, in Washington, Singman Rhee, who later became the first president of South Korea, issued a series of statements condemning the phrase. Korean groups at Chongqing, China, requested an interpretation of the phrase in due course from the American embassy. These circumstances demonstrate that although the OWI's Korean language news broadcast took the form of world news, their content was not entirely factual. The musical repertoire, which was broadcast together with these messages, consisted of uh, light orchestra music. This slide shows um, a list of some of the musical repertoire I have discovered th thus far. Represented here are brief and light pieces uh, from the European tradition. Yuan Strauss Wiener Blut and an intermezzo by Enrique Granados. The Granados might be included here uh, because of its association with New York. This work was premiered at the Metropolitan Opera on January 28, 1916. Holiday for Strings was written by American composer David Rose of MGM Studios. It is light orchestra mu popular music. Um, let me play a part of the music. <laughs> War 
Rehearsal Concerto, a short work for piano and orchestra, was written by English composer Richard Edinson for the film Dangerous Moonlight, released in 1941. <laughs> Broadcast also included music meant to inspire respect for the West. The U.S. national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, and the French anthem, the Marseillaise. The anthems were arranged for orchestra, but presented in a rousing style. Car King's purple peasant uh, represented the military through a march. <laughs> Also included was an arrangement of Chopin's Nocturne Number no. 2 in E flat major by Xavier Cuget and his orchestra. <laughs> Latin percussion, the nocturne sounded as much like a Cuban rumba as it does like Chopin. At the Library of Congress, I was able to listen to dozens of U.S. radio programs broadcast by the OWI toward Korea. Unfortunately, not all of these uh, recordings are in good condition because they were recorded a long time ago. So in many cases, I was not able to clarify exact titles, composers, and performers of the music. But from what I can tell based on the preserved sound is that the musical repertoire in Liberty Bell is mainly orchestra music. And I did not find any music with words. Like the list on the screen, the musical repertoire was mainly composed of European orchestra music in American orchestra music tinged with Latin or American jazz sounds, uh, like Xavier Cuget's music. Because classical music and jazz um, had become known in Korea in, 19, in the 1920s and 1930s, the musical repertoire in Liberty Bell would not have seemed strange to Korean people in the 1940s. As far as it is possible to tell from the recordings, the musical repertoire in Liberty Bell conformed well to the OWI's general policy about music. On August 25th, 1942, the head of the radio bureau in the OWI, William Lewis, held a meeting to discuss music for the broadcasts. 12 people from the Office of Civil Defense, the War Department, uh, the War Manpower Commission, and the OWI participated in the meeting, including Harold Spivak, the chief of the music division of the Library of Congress. The participants in this meeting called attention to the example of a popular propaganda tune, we will slap the Jeps right into the laps of the Nazis. 
The participants mentioned this song as an example of the, ki the kind of music the OWI must avoid. Written by Liu Polak with, with lyrics by Ned Washington, this song was published as a sheet music in 1942 as a reaction to Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. The OWI committee described the song as slushy and flip. Presumably, they found it to be in poor taste. This song was filmed by RCM Productions as a soundie in 1942. Here's the kind of music um, the OWI wanted to avoid. Oh, we didn't want to do it, but they're asking for it now. So we'll slap the Japs right into the laps of the Nazis. When they hop on Honolulu, that's a thing we won't allow. So we'll slap the Japs right into the laps of the Nazis. Thumbs up, England, we're proud of you. We'll show them there's no yellow in the red, white, and blue. I'd hate to be in Yokohama when our bombers make their bow. For we'll slap the Japs right into the laps of the Nazis. The committee felt that this music overtly reveals America's racist sentiments against the enemy and treated the idea of war casually. During World War II, some European critics working under Nazi rule described the United States as a barbaric country without culture or taste and denigrated its jazz. By contrast, Western classical music was associated with the social prestige for many people around the world. In Korea too, Western classical music was associated with the social prestige and considered as high culture. Given that prestige, it is understandable that the US government often chose orchestra music for propaganda, for propaganda abroad instead of focusing on jazz, a more uniquely American musical form. The particular mixture of Western hybrid music and popular music of the Americas chosen by the OWI was familiar enough to European classical music to borrow its prestige, but different enough to convey a distinctly American identity. Korean newspaper articles on American culture written during the 1920s and 1930s show that Korean people had a cultural bias against the United States. At the time, Korean people were well aware of the wealth and advanced technologies of the United States. It is not difficult to find Korean newspaper articles describing the United States as a country of freedom and American culture as modern. Nonetheless, these, these traits were described in very negative terms. For example, a writer in the Donga Daily wrote in 1930, quote, modern American women are crying out freedom. There are not so many women from other countries who have gained as much freedom as in the United States. Ironically, however, modern American women enjoy being enslaved. They have the freedom to cut their hair like a man in short skirts, revealing their knees. They flaunt down the streets with the hips swaying. They smoke a pack of cigarettes every day and drink a bottle of wine. They are modern women from the United States. They seem to have freedom. In fact, however, their thoughts are corrupted. American women are the slaves of the tyrant named fashion." End quote. At the time, um, jazz was considered as a symbol of decadence and vulgarity in Korea, a symbol of all that was modern in the United States. On January 16, 1934, the Joseon Daily wrote about jazz as follows. 
Morbid ero eroticism is one of the tumors that have kept growing behind modern culture. The Korean police reveals that the number of cafes, restaurants, and bars in which erotic stimulation is the only asset, and waitresses sing jazz on the red and blue neon lights. If we do not exercise rigid control over it, we will go in a direction that corrupts public morals." End quote. By straddling the line between uh, classical and popular music uh, for Western orchestra, the music that the OWI broadcast would have effectively countered this bias against jazz in the United States. This music reintroduced some jazz elements, uh, but under cover of the instrumentation of the European orchestra. This blend helps to replace the image of the United States as a country of self-indulgence with a more refined and respectable image. Unfortunately, it is uh, difficult to find documents uh, demonstrating Korean people's reception of Liberty Bell. Such comments could not appear in the press because the Japanese government's general of Korea controlled descriptions of American culture. They were not to be published in Korean newspapers or magazines uh, during the war. However, there are some clues that Liberty Bell was influential in Korean society. First, before World War II, Korean people were already able to access foreign shortwave radio broadcasting. On January 9, 1934, the Donga Daily reported that when a Korean radio fan turned on his audio equipment to listen to music late at night, he suddenly heard the sound of foreign broadcasting. In 1936, the Donga Daily reported that shortwave receivers were widely distrib distributed in Korea. And in 1942, the Japanese government general of Korea imprisoned about 150 Koreans who worked for broadcasting stations in Korea. They were accused of listening to the OWI's Korean language radio programs. Not only these workers, but also more than 100 other Koreans were subjected to an investigation for listening to the OWI's broadcasts. This incident suggested that Many Korean people were able to hear Liberty Bell, and it was influential to the extent that the Japanese govern colonial government imprisoned the Korean listeners. When Japan surrendered to the Allied forces on August 15, 1945, the U.S. Army established the U.S. Army military government in southern Korea. The northern part of Korea was occupied by the Soviet armed forces. The U.S.-Soviet joint, joint trusteeship on the Korean peninsula continued for three years. And in 1949, the joint trusteeship ended and two different Korean governments were established respectively in the northern and southern parts of Korea. And in 1950, the Korean War broke out and fully cut off ties between the North and South, establishing the divided Korea we know today. After the Korean War, as a traditional US ally, uh, South Korea played the role of the ideological buffer zone against communist North Korea, China, and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Back to 1945, after Japan's surrender, in keeping with the messages they had heard from the OWI, many Korean people considered the U.S. occupation forces to be liberators. On the streets, Korean people put up banners welcoming American soldiers. Around 10,000 Korean citizens participated in the welcoming parade for the U.S. soldiers that was held on September 12, 1945. 
at the official welcoming ceremony for the Allied forces um, held in Seoul. Uh, many Seoul citizens gathered and cried a hurrah for the United States, the Allied forces, and Korea's liberation from Japan. Of course, on the other hand, some Koreans expressed their concerns about Korea's autonomy under the U.S. military government. Also, as American soldiers came to live together with Korean people in Korea, uh, some U.S. soldiers committed acts of racial discrimination and violence against Korean people. This news disappointed Koreans and created alarm and skepticism. Nonetheless, um, the image and status of the United States as a liberation army uh, did help to erase the negative and degrading image of the United States and jazz that had been presented during the Japanese colonial period. In its basic outlines, uh, the music policy of the U.S. military government in Korea was not so different from that of the OWI. The Voice of America's Korean language radio programs uh, succeeded the OWI's Liberty Bell uh, with a playlist composed of Western classical music. The music was not necessarily written by American composers. However, all the music in these programs had to be at least performed by U.S. citizens, if not composed by a U.S. citizen. American jazz or popular music was only occasionally broadcast. Like the, U, uh, like the musical repertoire in the OWI's wartime radio programs, uh, the music policy of the U.S. military government in Korea did not pay much attention to promoting American jazz or popular music. Rather, the U.S. military government made great efforts to foster Western classical music in Korea. The U.S. military government fully supported the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra, the first South Korean orchestra made up entirely of Korean musicians, which could not have existed in Korea under Japanese colonial rule. It is noteworthy that under the Japanese colonial rule and the U.S. military government, uh, many Korean musicians wanted to learn and perform Western classical music. In his interview with an official of the U.S. military government in Korea, Do Ko Sun, the director of the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra Association, said that, quote, the cultural and racial pride of Korea had always been suppressed by the Japanese who did not allow the Koreans any freedom at all in cultural pursuits. Western music had always been appreciated by Koreans, but it's necessary to familiarize them with it once more and on the scale whereby they could take pride in their own knowledge of the Western music. Thus, the organization's aim was to promote Western music in Korea and to contribute to the musical advancement in the Korean Renaissance, end quote. Doko's interview reveals that the musicians of the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra considered Western music, especially European classical music, an advanced culture. The Korean musicians believed that they could recover Korea's place in the international society by fostering Western classical music in Korea. Officials of the U.S. military government were well aware of the Korean musicians' aspirations. That is why they uh, encouraged the development of orchestra music in South Korea and tried to build a positive image of the United States, not as a violent imperialist country like Japan, but as a country that supported Korea's growing international prestige and ethnic pride. The musical repertoire uh, that the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra performed included not only Western classical music, but also orchestra music written by Americans. The U.S. military government organized a U.S.-Korea goodwill concert 
and raised money from Americans who stayed in Korea to purchase new instruments for the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra. In this picture, the military governor, jo governor John Hodge hands one of the instruments to Im Won-sik, uh, the conductor of the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra. At the U.S.-Korea Goodwill Concert, highlighting America's generosity to Korea, the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra premiered uh, American composer Douglas Moore's village music, an orchestra suite drawing on American folk traditions. Let me play a part of the music. <laughs> Furthermore, uh, by holding national music festivals and competitions, the U.S. military government made a great effort to disseminate Western art music in southern Korea. Look at the screen. Um, this is a picture taken at uh, an audition in Seoul for the National Middle School Music Festival. This music festival was held in 1946. I think this picture shows well the U.S. military government's music policy. There is a Korean girl uh, on the stage. She is wearing Korean traditional clothes. Uh, and we can also see uh, the Korean national flag. She is about to perform, uh, play the piano. She is just maybe about to play the piano or she's just finished uh, her piano performance. Through this picture, um, we can see that the U.S. military government disseminated Western art music and at the same time tried to respect Korean identity. This music policy countered that of the Soviet Union, which occupied the northern part of Korea. Labeled as elite or foreign culture, Western classical music, especially from the Austro-German tradition, was discouraged by the Soviets and pro-communist Koreans. With the conviction that music should serve the proletarian classes, pro-communist Koreans prioritized music with the lyrics reflecting proletarian struggles. In contrast, uh, by supporting Western orchestra music uh, in Southern Korea, the US military government emphasized freedom of expression, promoting the idea of music for music's own sake. To sum up, the OWI's Korean language radio program fueled Korean people's desire for freedom from Japanese colonial rule during World War II. After the war, the US military government encouraged Korean people's desire for freedom of expression by fostering Western orchestra music that would contrast with Soviet policy. As a result, music contributed a great deal to rebuilding the positive image of the United States as an appealing and innovative international leader. The OWI's Korean language radio programs offered to Korean audi audiences a new style of orchestra music a mixture of Western hybrid music um, and uh, but a, a mixture of Western hybrid music and popular music of the Americas. By foregrounding American orchestra music, uh, the U.S. wartime radio propaganda highlighted the image of the United States as a bringer of Korea's freedom from Japanese colonialism, thus replacing stereotypically negative images of the United States. After World War II, the U.S. military government fostered the Goryeo Symphony Orchestra 
and widely disseminated Western art music uh, in Southern Korea against the Soviet music policy in the Northern Korea. At this time of transition between the colonial and colon Cold War era, filtered and mediated by the United States, uh, Western art music began to permeate the daily lives of Korean people. The OWI's Liberty Bell was an important precedent for the US Cold War music propaganda effort. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. I'm curious, you mentioned it was a shortwave radio that was coming, uh, originating from the United States. Um, Voice of America is in Washington, D.C. now broadcasting via satellite. Where were they broadcasting from, if you know, in the United States? And what was the connection um, from the perspective of uh, the government wanting to provide propaganda, music, and, and information into Korea, but they needed Korean uh, people that knew the culture and the language. Who were these people that they had tapped into that were in the United States and were using as part of that propaganda? Okay, um, okay. so the, I think the, for the Korean, specifically Korean language radio propaganda, I think, Based on documents, I, um, I conducted archive research at the National Archives of the United States. And based on the documents, uh, actually the people who the US government worked together was the war prisoners. So Korean people, some Korean people, because Korea was under the Japanese colonial rule, whether they Maybe they didn't want, I think, I believe, but Korean people had to fight against the United States as a Japanese soldier. So the US um, government captured the soldiers who fought as a Japanese soldier, but actually Koreans. So in the, uh, in the Office of War Information, they uh, run the educational program for the people the Koreans who fought as, an, as a Japanese soldier, and then they hired somebody, they employed somebody who is Korean. And based on the documents, some Korean people, many Korean people were willing to um, work together with the US government because they didn't like the situation. They were under the Japanese colonial rule and they were willing to um, work together with the OWI. But I do not know the specifically how who, I do not know any name or exactly who were the Korean soldiers, but yeah, one of the sources, I don't think they are, they were the only uh, Korean people who worked together the, uh, for the OWI, but uh, first, uh, the war prisoners who were Koreans. And the Shining Man Ri, the first uh, presence of, the, of South Korea, later he became the first uh, presence of South Korea. He was actually uh, one of the announcers for the Korean language uh, radio programs uh, for the OWI. Be before the OWI in 1941, I think it was COI, he was on one of the announcers for the Korean language radio programs uh, transmitted by the OWI. And actually, uh, many Korean historians discussed that through this radio broadcasting, actually, he was able to um, get a lot of support, political support in Korea because he stayed in the United States for a long time. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. The, well, there was also, from where were they broadcasting or whatever, the short wave, okay. and that's from him. And I had, was, is how often or f in a 24 hour day, mm -hmm. how much was sent and was it jammable, okay. you know, from a technical, Um, uh, they broadcast, uh, first day broadcast, I'm not sure exactly where they had the stations, but uh, in San Francisco there was an office uh, for the radio propaganda toward uh, East Asia. So I read a document, uh, the uh, the Man Ri, when he uh, worked as an announcer for the Korean language radio programs, 
I think he was in San Francisco and possibly other locations, but basically the uh, radio propaganda, U.S. radio propaganda of the OWI, the office for toward the propaganda, radio propaganda toward East Asia, the office was in San Francisco. Um, yeah, and second, actually the the hours of the Korean language broadcast, actually Korea is was um, not really focused on the U.S. government's government before the Pacific War. And because of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government began to pay attention to Korea. So actually, Korean language radio pro program was, did not really occupy a long time. So one day, around one hour, based on the schedule I collected from the National Archives of the United States, around one hour a day. But they uh, recorded that, and then they repeated. They rebroadcasted several times a day. Yeah, but a day, around one hour, but compared to other countries like Japan, they had much more programs, radio programs towards Japan or European countries. Yeah. Hi, so I have two questions that are a little out of uh, the scope of this presentation and feel free to just be like, that's not my expertise, no pressure to answer them. Um, I can just list them one by one so it's not like upfronted. The first is um, if you are able to offer any reflections on kind of what you found in the research, if any, regarding this idea or um, interpretation that jazz was dirty, um, kind of morally corrupt. I think we all know that jazz comes from black culture and after white appropriation and dissemination or mainstreaming um, abroad, if there's anything in the archives regarding that that you came across. Mm, so your question is, it's essentially like a question of colonization and anti-blackness and if- Anti-black. Yeah, if any of that attitude may have kind of spurred this like interpretation of jazz. In Korea? Yeah. You mean? Okay, so actually I haven't seen any anti-black propaganda in Korea. Rather, I think because Korea was under Japanese occupation. So interestingly, I do not think there is anti-black propaganda in Japan occupied Korea. Rather, uh, it's not, it was not in Korea, but actually the empire of Japan, they also broadcast propaganda radio programs toward the United States during wartime as a psychological warfare part of, but actually they used jazz because they wanted to, they targeted at African Americans against the US government because the, the empire of Japan, they were colored race and they wanted to build an international alliance with um, African Americans. But I do not think they did anti-black propaganda. Rather, they used jazz as a good propaganda material toward uh, African Americans. Thank you. Um, and the second is, it's a pop culture question. Uh, do you have any reflections on the rise of Korean pop music in the US and kind of its dominance in Southeast Asia? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, you mean the K-pop, popular music yeah. recently? Like BTS and all of them? Uh, I think, uh, definitely. Because uh, that really uh, made me think about the South Korean uh, propaganda through loudspeakers toward North Korea. And the, the, you know, there is DMZ, there is an aligned military zone, uh, the, the demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea. Actually, so, uh, the South Korean government, they broadcasted K-pop with, uh, in terms of music, music structure, sound structure is pretty much dri driven from American popular music. Although, it's, I don't think it's just a, a copy of American music though. So actually, I think definitely, yeah, South Korea is pro-American country, we can say in that sense. And uh, I think US armed forces, um, the US, uh, U.S. armed forces stationed in South Korea, even now. 
And many scholars have uh, told, had discussed that through the U.S. Armed Forces, the, there are many clubs for U.S. soldiers in Seoul. And through that clubs, because after Korean War, many Korean musicians, they performed for in the clubs for American soldiers. And then they began to perform with some American popular music styles. And that many people uh, discussed that that, is, that really had great impact on uh, the Korean popular music industry. But that's back to the 1960s and 1970s. So definitely, I think Korean popular music is influenced by the US culture, but at the same time, now what is going on with uh, K-pop is they really emphasize Korean autonomy, even though they got musical elements from the United States, uh, but they really, uh, it's K-pop is a kind of, um, let's see, it's really important musical sources for nation branding. So they really, so, yeah, so the U, uh, South Korean government really wanting to, want to promote K-pop for their nation branding. And there are a lot of uh, conflicts between East Asian countries. Many people talk about Korea's nationalism, too much nationalism. Nationalism through K-pop and in China or Japan, sometimes they, uh, Japanese people, Korean people, uh, Chinese people, they do some anti-Korean movement because of K-pop culture. These days a lot of things are going on, yeah. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Just to be official. <laughs> um, Thank you for your questions and thank you for coming. And I'd like to take one more opportunity just to thank Hai Jung Park for a really interesting lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming.